Hey guys, what's up? It's Johnny here and welcome to another episode of The Six Show. And as always, I'm super pumped to be here and we've got our little cat and we've got oh, B-Man. Oh. How are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good. I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> what's the cat's name? Yeah, your Kiki. cat's not my cat. Kiki. i got a German Shepherd, man. Okay. I just eat that thing. She's going to jump. <laughs> this week on the show, Brent interviews Benjamin Von Wong. And ben, Ben's got a little story about Violin Von Wong. Violin Von Wong. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben's going to inspire us with this, this amazing underwater model shipwreck image from bali epic and then he actually we're going to talk in about how he actually created it and he shares his philosophy on lighting artificial lighting you know which kit do you actually need to create these amazing images yeah man perfect let's get into it enjoy the six show share inspire create.com share all right, Ben, share something with us that not many people know about you. So I've done over 10 years of violin lessons. Um, I started when I was five years old. Um, wait, did I start earlier than that? Actually, I don't even remember when I started violin anymore. I think I start, actually, I think I started when I was four. Um, wow. Regardless, uh, my uh, parents brought me to, you know, good Asian parents brought me somewhere and they were like, okay, Ben, you need to choose a musical instrument. And they thought we were going to go for the piano, but um, I actually wanted to play the violin. So um, did that for a pretty long time uh, until I was about 15 or 16. Uh, I was playing in orchestras. Um, and then I, I, and I just decided that uh, it wasn't getting me the girls like a guitar would. Um, so I just kind of <laughs> let it go. And that was the end of that. So um yeah, my, uh, my violin career actually went off to a very, very strong start for the first three years. Um, and then what happened was I moved to China and we lived in a hotel for a year and a half, during which, you know, we had to change teachers and couldn't practice in the hotel and everything. So uh, my violin skills went down the drain and uh, it, it was more or less kind of the thing that I just had to do every weekend. I was playing in an orchestra. I even went, I uh, got to the point of going to Germany to uh, play in an orchestra and then I pretty much haven't really touched it. So I used wow. to play violin. <laughs> so, um, so how long has it been since you, you last played? Uh, well, recently when I was in Colorado, just two months ago, I was in someone's house and they had an electrical violin and uh, they had some Suzuki playbooks, which is the, um, the course material that I was learning. And I just picked it up and tried again. And it's really funny. It's like your fingers are so stupid, you know what it's supposed to sound like, but it doesn't quite do what it's supposed to. Um, yeah. but it was a fun, uh, yeah. Um, it's one, but, but I think, I think it could come back if one day I decide to cool things down and give some time to it. Um, it is, it is a nice skill to have. Yeah. I don't think you're ever going to cool things down, man. You, you're <laughs> on fire. <laughs> you never know. You never know. You could get disillusioned with the world. You could get tired of working all the time. You could yeah. want to try something new, just kick back and go for the simple things. I think there's tons of different options. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Good, good. Inspire. Uh, inspire. So the image I've chosen is probably the photo that has been seen the most in my career, which is this photo of a lady in an underwater shipwreck with her dress floating along. And it looks like she's walking along the bow of a shipwreck and, you know, these corals growing up. And it, it looks surreal. It looks photoshopped. Um, the girl's ghostly white. Um, but you, you just know she's underwater. And... Um, I guess the reason I chose to talk about it is just the one that's garnered the most interest. People seem always really excited about the idea that this was shot about 25 to 30 meters underwater in a shipwreck in Bali, where we tied the girl underwater and uh, took some photos of her in something that looks like a wedding dress. And the cool thing about the, the photo shoot itself is that there's a video that proves that it's all real. And and uh, I think that's probably the reason why it's kind of spread far and wide. I was on the front page of everything from like Nine Gag to <laughs> to Imgur and all that stuff, which is pretty fun. Um, so yeah, I uh, it was a it's a one off. It's really funny because I haven't done that many underwater shoots. I've done maybe three so far, but it's become one of those iconic ones where you know uh, people just recognize it um, until the point of where I recently got hired to do an underwater shoot in Mexico. Wow. Awesome. <clears throat> That's a great image, uh, Ben. I love it. And I know how difficult it is to shoot underwater. I've photographed quite a few models underwater in the ocean and in a swimming pool. And I know how difficult it can be, especially uh, dealing with a model that needs to smile and open their eyes and pose and hold their breath and not 
you know, um, look really weird by, you know, going like that. Right. You can't yeah, even talk to them. Yeah, you can't <laughs> talk to them. You got to, yeah, it's crazy. So you had divers come down and, and give her air, right? Oxygen? Yeah, we were an entire crew of people. She had her own two safety divers who would be looking out for her hand signals to see when she would need air. They would come over, give her air, pass her the mask. Uh, someone was watching over me so that I didn't drift away into something because of the current. Uh, and then we had one guy being the overall supervisor who was just making sure that everything was going okay. Um, you know, we had we had some really interesting problems. So the standard, like you were saying, um, directing, posing, breathing, all that, all those standard problems. And then we had these weird problems like tourists floating into the shot trying to take selfies. You know, underwater, it still happens. And, and you can't tell them to go away because they're, they can't hear you. They're just floating into your shots. You just have to take yeah. them and shove them off. So, um, And then even if they got away, then the bubbles kind of just stay in the vicinity of your entire shot. So that mm -hmm. was a little bit of a pain sometimes. But it was, it was definitely a unique shoot, unique experience. Wow. So and just a couple of questions on this image. I know when I've photographed underwater uh, models, it's um, you use a pretty wide angle lens because of the magnification factor when you're underwater. And the further away you get from the model, the, the worse the visibility is. So you've got to be reasonably close with the wide angle lens. And then you get all this distortion on the edges. that's even magnified even worse. So you've got to put them right in the middle. How did you deal with that? And what kind of setup did you use? Um, so I was going to use a uh, Nikon AW1, which for those of you who don't know, is more like a consumer level camera. Um, I drowned it the day before my shoot. And so I, uh, I had to just ask someone else for a camera. And the camera that I found was a Nikon D90. And so I just had a Nikon D90. I think it was in Aquatica housing. And I was just like, all right, let's just go ahead and do the shoot with this. Um, I had the option to use a Canon 5D Mark II. Um, but someone else was shooting video with it and I was just like, hey, you know what, I'll, I can do it with, I can do it with a Nikon. That's not going to be a problem. And, um, I kind of regret it. Ultimately I was, um, in, in retrospect because of how amazing the shots turned out, I should have probably, um, used like a D810 or something, a D800, I think at the time was all that existed and, and, and try to do the best shots possible. But, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about photography is the ability to share with others and show them how it's possible and you don't need amazing equipment to make it happen because we had no flashes, we had no underwater, you know, no, no lights, nothing. Um, and we still managed to make a really cool project out of it. And yes, if you look closely, the edges aren't particularly sharp. Um, we're using a, a crop sensor lens, um, but no one, no one cares. <laughs> the, the shots are nice on their own. And so even if you do zoom in and the resolution isn't quite there, we're looking at 12 megapixels, fairly noisy, shot underwater, you know, you can see particles in the water and stuff. But no one cares because because it still makes you dream because because uh, photography is more than just about the pixels. It's about the emotions that it's able to generate. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also the vision, the vision that you bring to these shoots. You know, I know you you're an amazing photographer and amazing visionary. You come up with these ideas and then you figure out how to do it with the technology that we've got available. So with this shoot, like, so was this a commercial shoot or was it something that you came up with? Like, how did it all come together? Uh, actually, this was a personal shoot that happened um, while I was on vacation in Bali. And my parents dragged me on vacation, uh, much to my displeasure. And uh, after I figured that I was going to be stuck on vacation, I thought it would be good to learn a new skill. And so why not scuba diving? And while reaching out to people on the internet, um, one of my fans by the name of Cassandra and dragon, um, she, she told me that she had a friend there that would love to meet me and he'd probably help me set whatever I wanted to up. And so I said, great, so let's organize a shoot. I met him for the first day on Saturday, explained to him the idea of getting models and dresses and makeup and everything. And, uh, you know, four days later, uh, four days later, I was, I was shooting and I, I didn't have a dive lesson yet. I didn't have a dive certification yet. So I got, I did three days of dive lessons, two days of shooting and I was flying out. So that was my vacation. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so you put, put quite a lot into the shoot, obviously it's like, um, how do you come up with the concept and, and how do you challenge yourself? You know, this is obviously a, a big challenge, something you've never done before. You've maybe seen images somewhere and you're like, Hey, let's give this a try. What, you know, what goes through your mind to actually do, do this and, and spend so much energy and effort on, on this one photo shoot? Yeah, I don't think I spent more energy on this one than I did on any other one. Uh, 
actually happened so quickly that it was more a question of do I do something or do I do nothing? And okay. and it, it was just it was just a fun thing to try. I mean, I I don't just sit in my bathtub and come up with amazing ideas. I um, I go out, I talk to people, and I use the resources that I have available in order to create the best project that I possibly can. And that always depends on what's available. In this case, you know, um, it just so happens that um, the dive master that was helping me set up the shoot, his wife was an underwater model and she knew um, a designer that had piece, white dresses that were laying around in his warehouse. And so I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have a vision of white dresses and I said, we need white dresses. Um, I did have a plan B in case we didn't find a designer and we actually bought some you know, some sheets from, from the hotel room and tore them up and made dresses out of them. <laughs> so we had a plan B, but you know, yeah. I, I kind of, you know, I wanted to do a shoot regardless of what happened. And so I went, I went with the idea that I was going to try to get as much as possible in order to make it happen. And, 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 and then things just unfolded the way they did. You know, I didn't, I, I would have loved to have more than two models, but I, I had only two show up, one of which flew all the way from Dubai the day before the shoot, just to be a part of the shoot. Um, she flew herself. She thought it was a great opportunity to, you know, a great experience. And, and, and it's not, the other girl flew from, uh, from, from Jakarta, I think. So, you know, I just had people paying their own dollar to come and participate in something and to have a unique experience. Um, my videographer flew himself in from Singapore. Um, and, you know, this whole shoot was only confirmed pretty much a day before it actually happened because we didn't know if we were going to manage to gather everything in time. And so, we did what we could with what we had available. And it, this, this one turned out to be a great gamble and others that aren't so great never show up. <laughs> so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, people don't remember it. They, they, don't, they don't think about it. So it's not a problem. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that uh, and inspiring us with that amazing image, uh, Ben. Create. So, yeah, so, so the topic I'm going to talk about is lighting uh, for a couple reasons. One, I think lighting is extremely important in order to uh, make, your, make your images unique because once you control the light, you control how your image looks. And then from there, the post-production is something you add on. But it starts with great lighting. And there's a whole bunch of different ways around lighting. You can, you know, you can, you can be really good at natural light and that's fine, but I, I don't think that's a reason to discount artificial lighting because at the end of the day, these are just tools in your toolkit and it's important to understand as much as possible so you can decide from that point forward whether or not you wanna use it. And then in the process of learning about this, um, you kind of figure that there is so much to buy, so much, so many different variations and so many different options that it almost complicates your life and becomes really complicated. And so anyone who's kind of started in this environmental portraiture route usually gets quite caught up on what they have, what they don't have, um, and use that kind of as an excuse to not be able to create certain images. And so I own, um, I own uh, two brown color move packs, four heads, uh, para 133, some soft boxes. And so you're talking about, you know, $25,000 of lighting. And so the cream of the crop of lighting. Um, but uh, if you look at my images on my site and you try to figure out which images were shot with a brown color and which ones were shot with a speed light and which ones were shot with no lights whatsoever, you'd probably be pretty hard pressed to figure that out. Um, and so I guess the point that I'm trying to get to is that lighting at the end of the day is something that's extremely fluid and flexible. And rather than think about what you, what you need to create something, figure out how to create whatever it is you want to create using what you have available. Um, because there are so many different remixes and options in order to get the effect that you want. Now, of course, there's a certain minimum. Um, you, you have to start somewhere, so you need to own some flashes, but I've seen absolutely phenomenal things accomplished with only speed lights. And you work with the constraints that you're offered. So if you have flashes that don't give you as much power, you get a little bit more restricted in the conditions in which you can shoot. Um, so the idea behind having extremely expensive lights is that they increase your probability of having a very successful photo shoot. But that, by all means, shouldn't actually dictate whether or not you'd be able to create it in the first place. Um, and so, um, I guess one piece of advice in terms of figuring out how to light your images up, one of the things that I have figured out to be the most practical solution is to not think about it too much. If you start mixing ratios, directions, modifiers, and you start getting really, really caught up in all the technicalities of it, and you just start looking at diagram after diagram, it gets really tedious. I mean, I know there are a lot of dudes out there, the techie guys who really love it, but the problem, problem with only thinking about a lighting setup as a setup is that 
you kind of lose the shot that you're trying to create in the process. So rather, rather than think about it, think about lighting as just um, a guide to follow, look at it more as a tool to tell the story. So what is a mood? What is a character thinking of? What is the environment you're trying to create? And why is your character popping out? How are they popping up? And that will define how you light it. And if it sounds really complicated, if you're lighting your thing and it, and it just doesn't look right, then just move your lights. You don't need to know exactly what's going to happen if you move it you know, 20 centimeters to the right, left, up, down. You just do it and you, know, you, have, you have a viewfinder in the back you just, or you just, you just check it out, take a shot, look at it. Um, and then you can figure out really quickly what looks good, what doesn't look good. There are simple tips that come along the way. Um, if you don't know which direction to make your model look, for the lighting to look good, a really good way to do that is just have them look straight at the light. You know, the lighting will fall over their faces. It looks really good. If you want your images to pop out, if you want your character to pop out of the background, put a little bit of a backlight, put a bit of a separation. It doesn't matter how close, how far, whether it's 90 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 45 up. Um, all those are just, you know, they're, they're details or technicalities and you will learn them with time. You'll learn them when you practice. Uh, you won't learn them reading up on other people's blogs. You won't re learn them by by just you know trying to trying to memorize setups and everything, so I think really the best thing that you can do is get out there and don't think about it too much. Don't get don't get too caught up. Don't get too worried about it. And so I guess that uh, that kind of summarizes my view of artificial light. It's a tool. You don't need to get you don't need to think about it too complicated. You can see right away whether it works or not, and then from there you can create the image that you have in your mind, um, assuming you've mastered it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Ben. That's that's great. And I follow your same philosophy. I follow the philosophy of just do it and do what you can with what you got. And I think that's, that kind of sums it up. And thank you. I mean, there's so much information in there. It's great. Wonderful. I hope I didn't just blab everyone's ears off. <laughs> no, I love it. Love it, man. We speak the same awesome. language. Awesome. Well, Wonderful. Thanks so much for being on the show and um, I'll catch you later. Thank you for having me. To find out more, go to shareinspirecreate.com.